Hello, everybody. Let's have a good week. Alexander, how are you? Brock, someone's typing very quickly. That was me. <laughs> you have skills. Hi, hi, Brock. How are you? I, I'm looking for a secretary. Hello, Hugo. And Mr. Gorshi, how are you? And Ryan, 195 words a minute. Oh, with I'm, one finger. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm... I'm not talking about typing. I'm talking about talking. <laughs> you can talk pretty rapidly. Anyway, how's everyone doing? <laughs> how's everyone doing today? So let's take a look around. Um, I'm looking for a high in the WTI this week. Um, there's kind of a look. You know, it's not classic, you know, we're we're diverging, but you know, this could be a three drive setting up here on a uh, four hour, two hour is confirming, one hour diverge, shorter term stuff is diverging up here, like the 15 minute. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm thinking there's a chance, uh, you know, there's nothing on the daily and you know what, even if we get a good solid hard break, um, it's happening at a confirmed high. So this is, you know, breaking some of my rules. Um, but I actually think there's a shot to pull all the way back towards this 50-day uh, moving average over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, interesting place for stock indexes to take a pause especially since it looked like we came out of here. You know, I'm not sure. Maybe this is something like 61.8 back or 78.6 back. And uh, NASDAQ's not quite as weak. And, you know, uh, we stalled at the 15.2. Uh, to me, I, last week I talked about 14.9 being a big area, and we broke out. So in order for this uptrend to continue on any pullback, should hold a couple hundred lower here. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, as far as the currencies, haven't seen this for a while. Uh, cable weaker than Euro. Okay, so Euro looks like, you know, it's gonna come out of here. Um, you know, I'm not looking for a huge bull market, but I don't know why we can't see, you know, maybe 117 or so. Um, and the Dixie, uh, I, I still think it has, uh, you know, after last week's uh, off number, I still think there's some more downside. I'm not looking for a crash. Who knows if we'll even get to 9350. You can't even think about getting long-term bearish until we negate the breakout. What do you think, uh, Ryan, coming into the, a new week? Uh, what do you, uh, I know that you're, you're a pro and you're, you're thinking about things all the time and most most likely over the weekend, you probably have some kind of uh, plan for things that you're looking to do. Um, what are you looking to do this week? Yeah, I think we're, we're going to be looking at uh, probably round about, well, what everyone's looking at at the moment, rates at the moment. You know, we've got a lot of talk this morning in the news about uh, BOE's Bailey talking about rate hikes and, and the market inferring that means November, uh, which is forward from December as they were thinking the week before so we've had a big shift in in you know money markets and uh, pricing of interest rates but it's not reflected across into the pound um, I think the pound already already made its move on on that last week um, so but we're seeing a we're now seeing this gradual shift across the interest rate universe if you like the ECB is now expected to hike 10 pips by September 2022 last week it was by december so this gradual shift in the rates is is weaving its way into the market and i think that's going to be the deciding factor but fx not really paying much attention to it at the moment yeah um, which is a bit of a bit of a surprise perhaps but uh, as i say it's we've had all that pricing and the expectation last week so i'm not sure what, what more it's to give and also markets i think are, are, are not they're not really seeing a big massive you know rate hike cycle coming um but there's, there's some in the market who, who are pricing it you know we're pricing uh bank of england rates to be one percent by august 2022 you know that's even pre-crisis rates were a 0.75 percent 
before the virus. So, you know, we're going above and beyond. And I think that's where we might start to see some trades coming. That's what I'm, I'm going to be looking for. If, if these markets get ahead of themselves in these rate expectations, you know, maybe they go too far. We see the pound running, you know, really high on those expectations. Then perhaps we've got a little possibility of fading that if they go a bit too far. What do you think of Euro pound finally making new lows for the move without any follow through so far? Yeah, well, this is going to be interesting to see if it holds below this uh, eighty-four fifty area, which was that that prior low. Um, yeah. If we if we can stay below there, I mean, you got the you got the trend line in there, and we're we're just above it now. Um, but yeah. If we can stay below that low, that's that's a start. If we get it back above that seventy eighty level, I'm going to start kicking the cat. Um, but you know, it's it never it never moves fast. Um, yeah. I, I said exactly the same thing the, the last few weeks. If it does break you know, 80 and then breaks 50, you know, it probably run into a brick wall 20 pips later. And, you know, here we are <laughs> doing exactly that. But, yeah. you know, small steps, the, the trend continues, as you can see, we had the, we had a bit of a pause there, um, had a bit of a brick wall. We've broken through the brick wall around 80, 70. It keeps the bearish pressure on. And uh, as long as we stay below, then, then I expect further downside to come. Okay. Because it kind of looks on the daily, like, you know, I know it's real stretched out, but it's still in form as a, a three driver. And, you know, we did not uh, confirm lows at the breakdown level. I'm not sure about other time frames. Mm, yeah, almost diverging here. I'm sure short term it didn't. Yeah, see, this is confirmed. So maybe it has some more work to do. Um, any feeling on uh, the metals, Ryan? Oh, they had their little pop uh, again. You know, short-term move that, that sucked everyone into, you know, all the balls thinking they got away with it, and here we go again. And you know, they've they've been spat out again. Um, yeah. And I think we, unfortunately, we're gonna we're gonna get back into the bit of sideways action again, um, seeing what rates are gonna do. Um, I think the US, you guys come into town now. You know, ten-year yields are, are ticking up again above one sixty. Um, you know, that's have we have we washed out last week's wobbles and now starting to build again. Um, you know, we're yeah. gonna move above 160. Let's look at the highs. You know, if we get up towards that that uh, the highs that we had last week, um, perhaps we take a knock on uh, have a go at that 170 level and then you know have another little break, have another little pop up. Um okay. but yeah, otherwise, you know, we're just gonna see it move to sideways again. Okay, so uh uh, good morning, Stelios, if you're around. Hello, hello. I'm just How listening to... Uh, I'm good, I'm good. I'm uh, listening to what Ryan is saying, and I, uh, I kind of agree. The, you know, the world's um, focus is now on still on inflation, what central banks are going to do. And like Ryan said, um, Bailey of the Bank of England, he didn't even hint it. You know, he said that we're going to act to counter inflation. Now, we've said this before, how does hiking rates actually make things move faster uh, in the supply chain? It's, uh, they, they don't, but uh, you know, they have to show that they're doing something. Um, and interestingly, I mean, I'm seeing, uh, I'm no longer a sterling market maker, so I don't have access to, uh, to the markets I used to trade, but I'm seeing short sterlings so or the futures, the interest rate futures. Um, they're down like 25 base points from, uh, December 21 onwards, which means a full hike being priced extra than when it was on Monday, on Friday. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I'm, I've asked a friend who is a Sonia trader um, to tell me if, if this is true in terms of what rates are implying in terms of Sonia's, which are the overnight rates. They, are, they, they follow much closer the Bank of England rate. And, um, but it seems that we're pricing 15, 15 base points in November. So we take to, take rates to 25 base points and then another 25 in December. Uh, if that's true, then I think the market's getting a little bit ahead of itself. Um, central banks, they do want to show that they have some power to do something about this issue, although they don't. <laughs> so yeah. they're going to talk the talk. They're going to try and taper and tighten and do whatever they can. The Bank of England is actually a weird situation because they're talking about uh, hiking before they're tapering. So they want high grades, but they're continuing the purchases as they are, which is a little bit odd, but say, hey, you know, they have some yeah, 
That is different than here, that's for sure. Yeah, they have some weapons in their arsenal. They'll try to use them as they see fit. Uh, but frankly, you know, tightening monetary supply in any way is probably just going to make things worse. Um, and, uh, you know, inflation is still going high. I was reading today that uh, natural gas from Russia, you know, Putin had hinted that he's going to increase supply to Europe. But um, from what I'm reading, um, uh, the actual numbers say that nothing has changed. So yeah. the supply is unchanged. So, you know, to, you know, to, 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 to cut the long story short, everything is becoming more expensive. Um, energy is more expensive by the day. And um, when that happens, your products are going to be more expensive. And also shifting um, products from one country to another. And, you know, the supply chain is getting a lot more expensive. You know, shipping rates, everything. Um, so, you know, people are saying, I was reading uh, Peter Schiff's um, latest podcast I, w- I was listening to, and he said, you know, stock up on stuff because things are going to get a lot more expensive. And I think I mentioned here before, last week, was it? I have a friend who works in uh, Belgium and he's, uh, he's in a big chemicals company. They, they do all sorts of stuff. And um, he said to me, there's going to be shortages of stuff, of, of detergents and, you know, things like that, which we can no longer produce because we don't have raw materials. We don't have the, uh, you know, um, uh, production facilities are shutting down. It's like, uh, dude, you know, you're scaring me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I know I, I I'm very upset. It's uh, there's a shortage of diapers here in the U.S. already. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you the truth. The shortage. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know, baby. <laughs> they're they're going to have to go back to cloth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any any thoughts? And uh, maybe I'll bring Blake. Yeah, bring Blake in. And it's uh, Blake you know, isn't I'll, here. I think. He's oh. not going to be here today, no. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, well, no. then I'm... Party uh, time. Huh? Oh, Party yeah. time. Get the drinks okay. cabinet open. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you guys think? I mean, for the last several weeks, Aussie has been the most resilient currency, uh, the strongest currency uh, during, you know, a small, even before the dollar kind of turned down a little bit. And today it's the opposite. Um uh, any comments on Aussie, you know, giving up the leadership so, and now being a weak sister? So it's same with CAD, right? CAD has been very yeah, strong as yeah, well. I mean, right. commod- commodity currencies have been doing well, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't read into one day's action. Uh, okay. I, I really wouldn't. Because um, I know Can- Canada held this uh, 61.8 back of uh, this whole rally so far. And, yeah. you know, we'll see. I mean, crude's making new highs, so. If you look at CAD, CAD, Aussie, Kiwi, Norway, they're all, you know, they've all done very well. And, um, you know, as long as uh, the prospects of inflation are high and, um, uh, you know, especially countries which are dependent on oil like Norway and uh, Canada, they, their currencies should be performing well. Um, but, yeah, as I said before, you know, a daily move for me, it's, it's just noise. Um, okay. Yields seem to be... Uh, going up more, you know, it's, uh, again, I don't think we've broken out, you know, 10 uh, year US, I oh, have yeah. been saying for a while, I think one, 170, what was the high before 170? 178. There, there you go, that high, you know, technically, right you, yeah, technically you need a break above that. Um, obviously, the, the thing that might happen, as, as markets usually do, is so they take out the high or the low, they get everybody one way and then they reverse and, uh, you know, screw everybody basically. So, um, but for me, you know, until we break that high, I'm not uh, treating this as a legitimate move, let's say. Clearly with inflation going where it is and with uh, cost of goods and services going higher, you just cannot have yields at, you know, 1, 130, 150. It's, it's, it's impossible for yields to stay there, especially when they're going to be hiking and, and tightening in general. So um, we have to keep an eye on bonds. I have been saying, I think we have been saying for a while, for years, that the bond market is probably the most, you know, the, one of the biggest um, mispricings of risk that, that I have ever seen. You know, I've been trading bonds for many years and I've never seen this. You know, you have junk bonds yielding 3% or 4%, whatever. That used to be uh, the safest of the safe government bonds. Right. But anyway, you know, yeah, it is junk. what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and S and P's are pulling back after a pretty good recovery here. Um, you know, uh, about two weeks ago, I I got you know out of my bearish positions in Nasdaq down here, 
And, you know, every time it looks like it might be rolling over, I think, well, should I put something back on? It's when I didn't get the follow through, you know, I thought this was going to be a big event, you know, breaking these two lines intersecting when it just, you know, turned out to be nothing. I got out. Uh, I kind of think we're going to new highs into year end. So um, I don't know what to do with it. Every time it breaks, I think, oh, you know, I have to control myself from FOMO, but. Um, I, you know, that's the way it looks to me. 14.5, that's a follow through point on USD Noak. We're getting, oh, that's Ronit. Uh, okay. That was on the uh, NASDAQ, oh, I think. Okay. All right. Um, I, you know, we're getting so close now to the, uh, we're two weeks away from the FOMC in November. And oh, yeah, that's yeah. when they're actually going to tell us, okay, we're starting to taper or we're going to be tapering on in this, Dece on December. So, um, we are now very close to them giving us specific um, information on their tightening. And if they don't, if they in any way are still, you know, vague and, oh, we're going to be monitoring and, yes, it might be appropriate to tie to taper and this and that, but they don't actually tell us something or they don't actually start um, with, the, uh, with the tapering, then I think markets are going to fly. Uh, yeah. Because they're going to realize that, look, these guys know that they can't do anything about this situation. Really, they can't. And they're accepting it. So um, yeah, it's all a game yeah. of psychology now from the central banks. Because I Jaw think they, boning. Yeah. Yeah, job boning. And they have to kind of, they, their job is very difficult because they have to um, calm the world down. That's what they have to do. And they're telling us from the beginning, inflation is transitory. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to be back to normal and this. And okay, it might take a little bit longer now. Bailey actually did say that the, um, uh, this inflation is not going to be as transitory as uh, initially thought. And, you know, this is something that I think most central banks are going to adopt. And they're going to try to uh, persuade us that this is going to be okay in the end. You know, don't worry about this, uh, you know, 10% <laughs> inflation on goods. <laughs> it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be okay in six months, you know. So um, um, that's that's important for traders to understand, you know, which way the the price risk lies. You know, the price risk lies not with announcing a taper. But if they don't announce a taper, that's where yes. we get the bigger move this time. You know, it's it's all like you say, it's psychological. It's about these shifting mindsets among traders. I mean, we we were saying last week, you know, the taper doesn't matter right now to the markets. They don't care. They know it's coming, even if it's between November or December. They know it's coming. There's there's no real trade on on that when they announce it. It's if they don't announce it, that's when we'll get the carnage. Yes. Okay. Um, any other thoughts that you guys have coming in here today? I don't, I don't know if Steve Volge's around today. He probably isn't. Is he? uh, he's probably picking up his son. No, it's okay. It's no, the no, three no. of us, I think. So. Okay. Um, yeah. um, what so else? Hey, Ryan, you know what? Week. We've, we've yeah. never seen what you look at during the day. You want to share your charts and uh, so we can take a look at uh, your I, setup? I can't because I've not got them on this machine. I've got them on okay. another machine. So I'll get okay, them I, can, I, I can take the screen. It's no problem. Oh. Let me, let okay. me, take, let me right. take it. And I'm going to have to get a page on uh, your trading view there. Yeah. So um, Okay, the other thing which is moving, obviously, is uh, cryptos and uh, Bitcoin is flirting with the highs, the all time highs. Wow. Um, and, you know, we've talked about crypto so many times. It's clearly still on a bullish um, trend after this. Um, I mean, I really thought at the time when when we broke below 40, uh, I thought we were going to be uh, sorry. When we uh, when we were around here, the 30s in the 30s, I thought we were going to go back right back down to the you know, 15 to 20,000 level but uh it was just um you know the, the the price action was way too strong and in a way in a way cryptos are one of the few um asset classes which are pricing um properly this um ridiculous increase in money supply you know we, we're seeing this over, over the past few years you know a dollar uh, 20 years ago is worth a lot less than uh, sorry is worth a lot more than it is now and it's going to continue like that and you know cryptos are just uh, exploding um and um interestingly it's bitcoin and ethereum which are leading okay today they're down a little bit but um they have been leading uh, um the charge over the past uh, days and weeks uh, but um you know, this is something I don't trade. I don't trade stuff I don't understand. But, uh, you know, you have to look at um, levels. And um, Bitcoin has been trading quite technically. So these highs um, are going to be important. 
uh, and uh, we are what five percent away or something like that. So um, that's definitely one to watch. Um, otherwise, we talked about yields. Yeah, we've got a bit of uh, inflation data out this week. Uh, oh, we do. Canada, yes, Canada yeah, and um, UK. Yeah, UK uh, final readings from uh, Europe. Um, one thing I'll, I'll highlight: we've also got UK retail sales out this week. Um, they're on Thursday, I believe. Let's have a look. Yeah, twenty second. Okay. Um, they're for September. Now, this is containing the month where we had all the uh, petrol stations getting cleared out of you know every juice and drop of petrol. So it, we could see a, a, a fairly decent jump in retail sales just on that factor. Um, and they're looking a little low with expectations of, of 0.5% rise. Um, so I doubt it, it will be that much market moving because it should be factored in uh, what happened. But if we do get a big upside surprise, um, that might be a, you might get a little algo pop that's worth a fade. Yeah, you you have to get an outsized number though, really, for any of these kinds of numbers to uh, to to move markets. But yeah, you you're right. How is the situation actually there with petrol and all that? Is is it still difficult to? Um, to... I think there's the odd, the odd place, you know, in in London and and you know some of the more um, busier areas, if you like. Uh, down here, it's nothing. It's all gone back to normal. Every garage has got petrol, and it's as if the last uh, three weeks didn't happen. So it was transitory. Good. Okay, I like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know what? I'm really, I'm really starting to look at the pound. I haven't, I haven't traded FX much recently because it's, it's all been kind of in a range or you know the stuff that I look at. But um, uh, Euro pound and the way the market is pricing in all these hikes and everything uh, on the on the Bank of England side, I really, really, really want to get along this. Uh, but I've been, I have, you know, Dale, you remember I've been saying this yeah. from from the really highs here. And um, yeah, 80, 83, 82, 83, 83. I think 83 is I'm going to start. And I think these okay. these lows here, I mean, they they look very powerful. And also the way the market's been very quick to price um, this hawkishness and this um, these rate moves from the from the Bank of England, um, it's um, I think the risk now lies on them disappointing. And um, uh, so I really I really want to. Start getting long this in the 83s. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Huge range for all these years. Yeah, this is five years, right? So it's uh, yeah, yeah. And and the other thing, obviously, that um, I'm interested in is uh, metals. And you know, we we are still kind of in no man's land in uh, both silver and gold. Um, friends of mine who know that I'm bullish, they're asking me, "Oh, should I get in now?" I said, "Look, if you want to get long." I think you probably want to wait a little bit. There might. Uh, it's exactly what I say here on Face every day. I think there probably will be a flush, um, maybe towards these lows in gold. And I, you know, and and the argument is, if there isn't, and we break out higher, well, the move then is going to be, I think, is going to be pretty large. So you know, you miss the first, you know, five percent, whatever it is, ten percent, and then, but you you catch the whole of the uh, the the move afterwards. Uh, yeah, but, we should um, go to new highs if we come out of there. I agree. I agree. And and it's perfect, right? It's it. We had this huge impulsive move from yeah. um, forget about COVID. Look, COVID is a, is a, is a blip. Yeah. We had this uh, impulsive move from mid uh, eighteen, all the way up from you know twelve hundred, what was it, eleven hundred something. We almost doubled, and now we're correcting in a in a really nice flag. And I love it. Obviously, the more it stays in here, the less the less convincing it is for bulls. But I still think the shape of it and everything is still okay. So. If we break out higher, you know, uh, I think we're taking out the highs. It's unavoidable. Um, but, you know, being a trader, I always want to get as, as best an entry as I can. And that's why, as I've said before so many times, my um, my positions are just under half of what I want them to be. Uh, and I'm waiting. Somebody's raising a hand. So are there other questions we can answer? Yeah. Uh, so what's your, what's your level for gold for getting in? Raj is asking that in the, in the comments. Uh, there you go. Okay. So these lows here, 1680. I think they, I'm waiting to see if they're going to get tested. I think the most probable scenario is 
actually not the most probable, 50-50. I think 50% chance they get tested. We might even break below, get everybody um, caught, you know, off guard. Um, longs get taken out, and then shorts get, uh, you know, initiated, and then we just go. So I think I would probably start looking at, uh, you know, anything below 1,700, between 1,680 and 1,700, I think I would start um, accumulating. Actually, I will start accumulating. Um so it's we're still not there, but we're not a million miles away. And silver, we have something similar. You know, this this zone here is between say twenty one seventy and twenty two thirty or something like that. That's that's where I want to get some more in. There is a chance. There's always a chance we might get back to this zone, like nineteen ish. If we get there, that will be a miracle, but a um, but an absolute gift. So that's what I'm looking at. Uh, for for potential entry levels, but it takes uh, it takes a lot of patience. You know, I'm not a day trader, yeah. and I just keep looking at these prices every day. You look at price action, you look at the way it goes, the volume, everything, and you try to make the best best decision you can. Um, the other thing which has been an absolute monster is oil, and we've been talking about this for a while. I really thought that these seventy five to eighty range would have held. It just went right through, and uh, you know, it's in hindsight, it's not surprising with commodities just, you know, just screaming higher. Every almost every commodity um, uh, going higher, and uh, it, it's um, it's just it's just a train you don't want to get in front of. I I don't dare short this at all. So, what do you think? What do you think this leg in oil is about? Because it hasn't really followed over the last few months. It hasn't really followed the other commodities. Um, it's only been the last you know couple of weeks that we've really kicked on again. Um, obviously you've got all the OPEC messing around going on. Um, but I've, you know, when you watch commodities and they've all been jumping and you look at oil and you thought, well, it's not, it's not really getting on the train, but now all of a sudden it seems to be, it's you know, catching up. Yeah. Everyone's well, I, talking I, about hundred bucks. You know, I, I put a story in the room yesterday, um, wall street journal saying that, that, you know, the hundred strike in options is, is the, you know, the most sought after strike. Is it? Uh, okay. People planning for for two hundred bucks as well, you know, getting options calls in for two hundred bucks, you know, and sometimes when you get the that, market that, all leaning that one makes way, you want to sell it with both hands. Well, exactly, but it also feeds, you know, the uh, the the saps behind who think, oh, it's going at two hundred, and they'll start buying it blindly. Um, well, you also get uh, the head, the hedging of the options, right? So we, you know, yeah. if everybody's buying 100 calls or 150 or 200, then you got to hedge a delta, the guy who sold them, and it's exactly. uh, it's pushing. It's, it's a bit like uh, Tesla Tesla stock. Oh where, yeah, yeah, that's where, happening in the market stock market. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't sell this. I mean, there's no way. But why is oil catching up now? Uh, I don't know. If anybody knows, I'd be very interested to uh, to hear it. Quant. Anyway, yeah. all right. There are lots of bets. Uh, we're going. You know, we have a very um, aware um, uh, uh, audience, attendees, and these guys do a lot of research. And you know, we get a lot of good input from them. And they're saying that the uh, December twenty two is where there's bets on two hundred dollar oil. So that's uh, you know over a year away. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, it might take some type of major supply disruption to get up there, not just inflation. I, I, I think there'd have to be something well, worse else now. going on. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, something like, you know, Putin uh, holding back or, you know, something happening uh, in the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, I, I just don't think we could get to 200 just out of a supply demand story right here. Maybe a crash in the dollar would help. Um, but wow, we're headed for days that, you know, uh, most people aren't prepared. I mean, you know, I'm not used to not being able to get anything I want at my fingertips. So this is a big change for people to have to wait, you know, if you need a part, uh, you know, you can't get it done. Uh, this is, uh, you know, really going to test, pe you know, you talk about patience about, you know, waiting for an important part and you can't even uh, drive your car till you get it. And that's, you know, that's like a big that. effect. That's a big yeah. effect on, on the economy. Um, yeah. You know, people were marking the, the PMIs last week and, and we've got uh, the flash PMIs this week in Europe as well. Um, 
you know, PMI is dipping back and people saying, oh, you know, the economy is weakening. But it's it's why is the economy weakening? Is it weakening because demand's fallen? Um, that's not the case. It's weakening because people can't physically produce the goods for uh, and fulfill orders. And, you know, right. that's that translates into low activity. That's going to translate into lower GDP. But what it does mean is that when these issues get solved, you're going to get a, a potentially a big snapback in economic activity. You know, you get a big short term jump in in growth yeah, when it all comes back again. Demand that hasn't exactly. been able to do anything. Demand. It's only if it's only if demand drops, then we're in trouble. Then you've got this high inflation, low demand, economic weakness, and uh, good luck uh, hiking rates into that, fellas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. Uh, you know. Uh, Great questions, everyone out there, and nice coverage by you two guys. Uh, Thank you, Dale. Ryan and Stell, really, really nice coverage. And uh, Cheers, why don't we wrap it with uh, what's the trade of the week for you guys coming in? Ryan, what do you, what do you think? My trade, I'm going to be, I want to get in on some long Aussie. Um, long Aussie, buy weakness, yeah. Aussie uh, week today. Maybe another, what, 50 lower or something like that, right? Yeah, and I think anything down to the low 73s, I'm going to start building a position because I, I think the RBA are talking bollocks when they about their 2024. 20, <laughs> okay, so hikes. still, I don't think we're going to get to 82 EG yet uh, this week. So uh, You never know. 83 we might get. That's, that's the one I'm looking at All most right. uh, intently. All right, so we get to 83. Stell's yeah. going to be uh, buying EG. Yep. And uh, thank you guys very much for hanging out uh, during Face with me. And uh, I'll bring in our guest, Adam Turkman's with us today. So uh, stick around. Adam's got really uh, has some insightful views and uh, looks at uh, the big picture. So um, Adam, welcome. Welcome back to Face, buddy. How are you? Waiting to hear your voice. Adam, he's How he's unmuted. You? Yeah, you guys able to hear me? Oh, yeah, you now, Adam. Great, there. How hey, are how, you? How, how, I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Good. Nice to have you back. Welcome back. And uh, uh, you're going to share your screen, screen uh, button. Yes, I am. And I think I saw a tweet by you uh, today. You were talking about, uh, uh, well, what you wanted to talk about. Um, I know that you're bullish uranium and, uh, you know, uh, it finally really hit the news, uh, the move in uranium. So nice call. Nice call. Yeah. I added them. Yeah, I got lucky on that. Um, you know, uranium okay. was it was such a um, I'm actually skeptical of uranium going forward just because of the reflex reflexivity of it and the. The I don't know the market at this point like energy everything is so everything is so um you know volatile and high in price that it's it's hard to know what's genuine right now or just like speculative excess. Yeah. Okay. So uh, is any of the uh, supply chain constraints coming into your work? I know you're you look for contrarian things. I was just thinking if uh, you know every I. I I, you know, someone just uh, mentioned here in chat, I'd say that consensus is it's going to be resolved. And I would say, uh, contrarian, what someone just said, that's going to persist for longer than most people think. Where do you come down on that? Well, it's, it's tricky because even with, I mean, the entire global economy, we're, since the 70s, we've been in an age of surpluses. You know, globalization, uh, basically air-conditioned and large-haul shipping freight really changed the world um, ever since the 70s, 80s. And we haven't really seen the supply chain screech to a halt and then turn back on. So... I, I, I genuinely think a lot of the inflation crowd is patting themselves on the back because they were wrong for a decade about predicting, you know, like above trend inflation. But even if you had an economy pegged to gold, which, you know, go back pre-1971, there were multiple periods where inflation broke out because of supply issues. That was 
the big problem, usually during wars in U.S. history, was um, was that supplies would dry up Shortages, really quickly yeah. relative to demand. Yeah, and since yeah, like 70s, World War II, everyone turned into yeah. rubber, and exactly they used They're, wood on cars. That's how we came up with woodies, and yeah, and yeah. So we saved everything and turned it into the war effort. Exactly, and right now today we're seeing not as an extreme of the war effort, but it's, it's, I don't see how there wouldn't have been inflation. And I remember last year talking with someone, I still think structural deflation is the plaguing of the world. Uh, the world's problem more than inflation because the, the, pretty much the two big drivers this year have been pushed that have been really, you know, throttling markets have been energy and food. Well, the two big reasons those have really gone up in price so suddenly was because of there have been really bad weather issues this year and there was really bad supply side because of low prices. Um, you know, and the Talking you know, farmers grain. were getting yeah, grains were getting killed up until recently because you know there were there were farmers dying because they, you know, their soybeans and everything were so low price right before Trump left office. And then all of a sudden you had a total reorganization, you had China after they dealt with their horrible uh, African swine flu uh, crisis, they had to restock their their pig, their pork supply, which takes well, a lot they, of corn. They've been stockpiling wheat for you know at least five years. So yeah, I mean I, the grain side, they've been stockpiling for quite some time. Yeah, and they they really stepped it up last year after they had to rebuild their entire hog supply. And so you you have these factors that even if we were in a booming economy, pegged to gold. Um, I don't see how suddenly, t you know, having supplies globally get whacked wouldn't push prices up. So to me, it was never really a, a big question of like a little bit above trend inflation. Now, yeah. th that's so it's no not monetary inflation. It's uh, supply shocks. I, I, yeah. So yeah, like we've talked about your point. Yeah. Yeah. There's the three types of the inflation, the demand side, supply side, and then the monetary you know, throughout history, demand side has been that creeping inflation where you have like during periods of calm, usually there was no wars. You know, the men weren't going off and dying times of no plague. Um, so the people were living longer and they were having more children at a earlier age. Well, when you have the like we were saying before the 70s, usually, you know, up until like 1000 AD recorded history, we've seen that there's been just, you know, little price changes of one percent a year. But over 100, 150 years, that 1% adds up. You know, that's what? That's probably like 400% compounded increase in price. And when you get to a point, historically, there would be the rising prices. It's like when we go to the grocery store, we'll be like, hey, the, you know, things have gotten expensive. Like, you know, I remember a decade ago, I was able to get way more for 100. It's not like we're doing it every single year, noticing it losing 20% of its value. It's like a slow creep. Yeah, invisible depression. Yeah. And then, but the, the, the really tricky part with that is historically, there's been once the creeping inflation built up, there would be periods of like a supply issue. So, um, you know, in the host, uh, medieval days, it was usually a crop failure, yeah. uh, just like bad weather. And then all of a sudden, it would That's send grain almost, soaring. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then, yeah. you know, population men usually, you know, they would, it would lead to revolts. You know, some of the largest empires collapse during, you know, creepy Damage. inflation periods, supply, yeah, yeah, grain shortages. And, and then you'd have marginal fields go online. And then, um, and then usually there would be like a big war and there'd be a huge population decline or the play came in the 1300s, late 1300s. And then all of a sudden there was a huge period of deflation because you okay, suddenly so have- So all we need now is like World War Three. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that to so, bring down the population. So, the problem, yeah, so the problem <laughs> now is that if you look at the inflation, um, yeah, let me see if I can pull it up. I was just looking at this actually recently. Uh, the CPI, I think the chained the history of. So uh, uh, okay. besides of, okay, go ahead. So basically, there. up until twenty, you could see CPI was very volatile. 
Um, and there's actually a lot of studies that the CPI has overstated inflation by 1% per annum since World War II. And that's because of biases, you know, substitution bias, new quality bias, uh, bundling bias. You know, like when you go to a supermarket and they and they just check the price of an egg, that's not, yeah. you know, accounting for like, you know, when you go to like Safeway and it gives you, you know, those, uh, you know, coupon, you know, monthly you know, you can save like 30 bucks on groceries or you get like, a, you know, you or like a computer, you buy one computer product, you can get, you know, Windows Office or whatever, you know, you get all those like uh, bundling products with it. So the CPI hasn't really been a good measure of inflation relative to quality. And but even just using the CPI, we can see it's, it was very volatile. Like, you know, you have spurts of 15, 20 percent, like we were saying during periods of war. Or in the 70s, uh, when there was a lot of supply issues, like a lot of the inflation in the 70s was the oil, oil embargo. embargo. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and so even when we were on a gold standard, which there was monetary inflation, but the way monetary inflation amplifies um, demand side and supply side inflations is because you're putting more money in the economy. And when there's more money injected actually in the real economy, you're giving people more tickets to buy things. There's no more money for fewer goods. But what happened after the 70s that so there's a great book called um, Financial uh, Paul Volcker happened. Uh, yeah, yeah. The 70s. Paul Volcker. And there, there's a great book that really it kind of puts it in perspective because it wasn't the dollar breaking from gold that really led to the inflation. The CPI in the U.S., like we already see before we broke from gold between 1960 to 1970, the CPI had already risen 90 percent. I mean, it was already a big increase, even while we were pegged to gold. And yes, the U.S. was doing its guns and butter. But the point is, like, why is it back then the when the U.S. had printed far less money and had even higher rates, was able to get more monetary inflation than post 2008 when they printed four trillion and they could barely keep it above two percent. Like if you look at the CPI, the average change in the CPI since the 80s, it's been mute. And or rel it's been the longest, slowest decline. You know, it's known as like the second great deflation. The first one is the late 1800s, which like killed farmers and led yeah. to like the big uh, populist movement, uh, you know, in the U.S. But now now we're having a thing where we're unpegged, but inflation was going down and the central banks, no matter what they could do. They really underestimated the age of globalization and they put their foot on the gas and um and the byproduct of this, by them trying to stimulate inflation, because, you know, to make their debt cheaper, um, it, I mean, decreased debt in real terms, that's like the real big point of it, is that it created tons of speculative bubbles. So the monetary inflation acts as like a very volatile gas on the supply and demand side. But ever since the 80s, uh, like I was saying, there's this book called uh, Capitalizing on Crisis by uh, Greta Krippner. And basically her, th her thesis, which is, you know, very profound, is basically saying the U.S. governments, uh, pretty much the world economies, made too many entitlement promises after World War II, but growth was slowing. So even before inflation was picking up, you know, there was stagflation. There was, you know, the there was like recession, the slower growth in the before the 90s it was just it was like diminishing returns once we entered the third industrial revolution which began in the 70s um there there was diminishing returns and we could see that in worker wages you know real worker wages compared to productivity the bottom 90 percent of wages declined and workers couldn't crystallize these gains as they could in the second industrial revolution because the the high hanging fruit were gone so we got to a point that the Fed real incomes were declining before the break from gold and growth was slowing. So they had the easy solution, make debt cheaper. If an individual isn't going to be able to have his wages increase, then he should be able to borrow the difference. You know, the average family should go out there, you know, if they're making less money, then they can, you know, use their credit card to buy goods. So they had to fin hyper financialize the entire economy. And that's what we saw after the 80s. But for them doing this, they created a huge savings glut with the top 1% because the 1% compounds their returns much faster than the uh, average earnings have gone up. So you've had the richest 1% parking their money in banks, 
which kind of created a debt trap for the bottom 90%. Because you because when you have so much money supply, yields go down. When you, you know, when the banks are loaded with money, yields go low. And that's the problem we've been seeing, uh, regardless of what the Fed's done, was that yields have gone down globally because there's been a savings glut and a dearth of investment. And that's today what we're seeing in reverse repo. There's the, the banks are telling, you know, basically QE, it doesn't even the QE is being nullified at this point because the banks are getting the money, the reserves, and then they're just sending it right back to the Fed. I mean, every night they're sending something 1.4 trillion back to the Fed. Every single night, you know, a group of 70 to 90 banks, um, you know, money markets, funds, so what, whatever. Okay, so, uh, all right. So what's a contrarian play? Um, short energy, short uh, gold, uh, you know, people that are buying inflation hedges, is that your stance? Is that uh, uh, the contrarian play is uh, to still bet I, on so yeah, I, I, I personally think um, back in April when yields hit like 1.78, I went yeah. long bonds. I thought that was a great opportunity to go bonds and long dollar by short okay. foreign currency, especially the f- short euro I did just because – uh, okay. I, I also did a short China thing, which worked out luckily because of the property sector. But this doesn't even include China right now, which, you know, is a really deflating. Case. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that's the real big thing that the mainstream. OK, so a I, lot wanted, of- I, I asked almost everyone I interview. I want your opinion. You're, you know, you're very you know, you've done a lot of research on this. So uh, back in 2008, in the great housing crash, Great Recession, the narrative was, well, you know, China's still growing. Uh, they weren't as affected uh, <clears throat> by toxic paper. And that their growth was going to help pull the world and the U.S. <laughs> out yeah. of recession, right? So, uh, you know, we did. We, You know, it was also, you know, Fed action. So, you know, the market can't have it both ways. And China's a uh, much bigger percentage of GDP now than they were in 2008. So if they could pull us out of recession, can they pull us into one? Oh, absolutely. And and this is the thing about China. As this chart I have up, when you can see, up until 2008, China's main way for growth was exports. I mean, they were exporting some almost 40% of their GDP was exports. That's an insane number when you think about it. But after 2008, it crashed. Well, what happened? You can see in what picked up after 2008 was domestic credit from banks. So like you were saying, China pre-2008 was dumping their excess onto the rest of the world. They were running huge surpluses, forcing the West to absorb it with their deficits. Germany does the same thing today. Today, Euro and China, they're both running surpluses, trying to eke out growth, forcing a deficit country like the US to absorb it. But what happened after 2008 the rest of the world said, hey, we're tapped out. We're, we're up to our neck in debt. We have to deleverage. Well, China had two points, cut back exports, which would have made um, growth and unemployment rise. Gro- growth would have fallen in their country and unemployment would have risen, you know, as factories had to turn off. But the CCP is very sensitive, you know, their, uh, you know, their, uh, their promise that's always known as like that undercover promise between the CCP and their people, as long as they, you know, give them their growth and a job, they kind of turn a blind side to the loss of freedoms, you know, the more conservative state. That's kind of been their their promise after the Tiananmen Square incident. And so China said, okay, we're going to, instead of depending on the rest of the world to absorb our excess, we're going to do our own building boom. And Xi, President Xi in China, and this went on for a decade, but in 2019, when this, when this tightening, deleveraging pretty much started, because if you look at China's bond defaults, it rose shockingly, it's been new records each year, but it really rose in 2018, 19. And President Xi uh, came out and he said, listen, there's two types of growth that we've had. The high quality growth, which has been exports and productivity, uh, you know, services, the growth we want. And then on the other side, there's been low quality growth, which has basically been just malinvestment. Both cities. And yeah, yeah and cities. go cities. And as China's high quality growth diminished, which it has everywhere else in the world, they ended up focusing more on low quality growth, like their provinces, to make up for the difference. I mean, to put it in perspective, China's uh, input incremental capital output ratio relative to GDP, meaning yeah. basically capital efficiency for each dollar they spend, how much they get, you know, uh, 
how much money they have to spend for each unit of growth. It was at a, it averaged three for the decade before 2008. Well, up until recently, it's hit 11. So they're spending $11 now for half the growth they got. That's like walking. So that's three times the incremental. So output. is there a play on, in their currency in the yuan here? Well, so, so that's the big question. So like you were saying, now China has a huge low quality growth dependent economy and Xi is depend like not depend I'm sorry he's very um committed to trying to rebalance his economy but that's going to come at a cost of growth because real estate it makes up about 30 percent of China's growth China's real estate is about three times as big as U.S. real estate uh, market so and China alone between 2013 and 2018 drove 30% of global GDP. A lot of that came from commodities, which went yeah. to building these ghost cities. So as China deleverages, 70% of net assets uh, of the average Chinese are in real estate, homes, like that's their value. So imagine when Falling prices whacked I, the U.S. Well, they already have. I've heard values are down 40, 50 percent. Oh, yeah. Since Evergrande. Okay. It, it, yeah. And, I, and they're probably they're going to go low. I don't see how they're not going to go lower as as the China is forcing their property sector to deleverage. So not even accounting for the uh, not even for accounting with the decline in household values because China's real growth is investment, not consumption driven. But like you were saying, what happens going forward? There's two ways. Will China try to make up for their declining growth? Um, because China's total factor productivity has declined over the last decade, like the world's. Like everywhere's looking for returns. You have a flood of money and a dearth of investment. Just economic returns have dried up, and China can't avoid that problem either. So, A, does China go back to trying to export? like dumping their goods on the rest of the world to make up for the growth, which is very deflationary by them dumping their excess abroad. Uh, because that by definition deflationary when you're, you're dump when you have such big surpluses, you're dumping more on the world than you're uh, consuming yourself. And, but you already have Germany and the Euro and other Asian economies trying to squeak out their growth uh, through exports. And, amount of, and now if China does it, they're going to have to cut the yuan to do it most likely, which will be very deflation. Like we saw in 2015, when they cut the yuan slightly, it sent world into almost a deflationary shock. Or the second solution is, does China empower their consumer, increase wages of, at home? And stop it up. It, exactly. So they become the marginal growth and I mean, the consumer in the world. So, so I personally don't see them doing the second option because China has repressed. They have very harsh, like compared to America, the consumer is very repressed in China. And in most fast, high growth export driven economies follow that route. Like we saw it in the Soviet Union. We saw it in Japan. You know, they focused on. Uh, forcing their consumers to save. So then the banks, I mean, to, to spend less. So when you spend less, you're saving the difference. And when you have, you know, in economic theory, savings equals investment. So when you have all that money in the banks, the state can come out and take easy funding to deploy where they want. So either China allows their consumer to start spending those savings, going into debt to fuel the rest of the world. That would be very inflationary, I'd imagine, because all of a sudden you have a population of 1 billion plus three times the US, you know, gobbling up whatever they can, or you're going to have that economy because China has a spending problem. Asia has a spending problem. They, uh, they, they don't spend as much. And that's what the Western economies have been begging them to do for the last decade and, you know, decade plus, but we haven't seen it. Okay. And we do the opposite because of financial repression that it doesn't pay to save. So they must get a little bit of a yield over there. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, so um, I think you're still on uh, what I'm reading, still on the deflation bandwagon. One more swoosh, maybe, right, Adem? Yeah. But, okay, with your narrative right now, and I know I'm not a premium subscriber, but I've given you some oh. visibility here. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, uh, what, what's actionable uh, with your thesis and narrative going forward, say, into the end of the year? What are you looking uh, to do? So, yeah, I was a 
I made a pretty penny with uranium this year. Right. Or that's old. We did uh, the yield. I still like anytime. And if it's nothing, rise. that's fine too. I mean, there are there are times that maybe you don't see anything. Yeah. Uh, you're I, just, uh, so are we there? Right now, I'm actually... I'm shorting commodities base metals because okay. I I'm like locking in long-term optionality like uranium. I would rather find overvalued like a veil or uh, you know, et cetera, these over leveraged uh, miners that are very dependent on, you know, commodities, China's demand, maybe, you know, the Australian okay. currency, you know, et cetera. Like I'm, I'm looking at locking in long-term optionality that you know long dated out of the money puts on these that if i'm wrong you know in a year from now it won't hurt yeah. me i lose you know a couple thousand but like in uranium if you're right that couple thousand can return you know 20 fold and it makes up for those returns that's why having optionality in this market is important but never selling it obviously you don't want to sell options and get your head blown off yeah. if, if uh, the trade because markets are going to yeah. be volatile um i think inflation is going to even even like i'm not when I talk about like deflation, I just talk about structural deflation. I've written tons about inflation up until 2018. I was a big, you know, you know, inflation's gonna eat away at everything, it's gonna erode. But then I really learned the difference between asset inflation, which is a yeah. side effect of the Fed's policies, right? The, which is having to financialize the economy to make there up is for the no loss other of alternative income. forcing there people is to no take other alternative. risk. Exactly. Yeah. There is no like the Fed can't. Like, do they probably, they obviously see this housing bubble here. They know it's, it's a shortage. There. Exactly. It's a shortage. And if you actually look at the, so that leads to another thing in the U.S. There has been a horrible concentration of sectors, meaning uh, like oligopolies. Uh, this chart I have, look at the decline of uh, uh, in, uh, antitrust enforcement in the U.S. It's pretty much disappeared since the 80s. Yeah. So you're having, and then you had a M&A wave, mergers and acquisition. Um, I wrote about this recently on my site, but there's been a, uh, like a cartelization of U.S. and it has all the symptoms. It has above trend profits, declining uh, net investment, higher artificial prices, squeezed wages, lower productivity. These are all the signs of an oligopoly. And if you look at in the US, two major beer companies control 90% of the beer market. Uh, you yeah. know, there 80% of US households only have one or less option of like a uh, modem, like, you know, a yeah. internet provider. And yeah. we've gotten to a point where we have less freedoms. And when you have right. a monopoly, you and the anti, I mean, the, uh, the DOJ pretty much gave up on, I mean, the revolving door between governments and, uh, you know, uh, the private sector has gotten, you know, and now they're coming and back to our, do they have the wrong target with Facebook and Google? It, it's and too should... late. It's at this point, like there it's, yeah. it's jawboning in my opinion, because if you All look right. at how many people left, um, Google that worked in Obama's uh, office, it was tons of them. And the Bush administration, there went from over 100 defense contractors in the 90s to now there's just nine that are the most powerful. Like everything is consolidated. If yeah. you look at no, new public firms, the amount of public stocks in the indexes fell from a peak of 8,000 in the late 90s. It fell in half today. So we're seeing big companies get bigger by absorbing competition. And then they're raising, then they're, um, then the lobby dollars have exploded because these firms are lobbying to erect uh, barriers of entry, which prevents competition. And when you don't have competition, you have declining wages, declining net investment, lower productivity, squeezed wages, and all that other nasty stuff. So yeah. that's another problem that is leading to inflation because they're restricting supply on purpose to keep their margins artificial. So we do have inflation problem, rising price problem in this country for sure, but it's not monetary because monetary, if you look at bank loans and leases, like how much banks have to lend money to create money in our modern financial system and bank lending has declined like very bad compared over the last you know four decades. And it's like what we've been saying since the 1970s, we can't escape diminishing and economic returns, just falling lower. It's a global problem. Uh, what China does going forward will probably be very important. But, yeah, you know, I, I don't see them suddenly unleashing their consumer to, you know, 
change or it won't happen that fast because the power elites who got rich off exports and infrastructure are already in place so you know historically okay. it's come in a very nasty fight when there's a big rebalancing like we saw in japan okay so uh Adem looking for China would help uh, Adem's position if China kept dumping commodities. So um, uh, thank you so much. Oh, okay, so here's your website. Oh, yeah, this is just my website. If anyone's interested in uh, catching okay. up with, uh, you know, what's the address? Uh, speculatorsanonymous.com. And okay. then my Twitter handle is just uh, at Radical Adam. Okay, and you also have a premium for getting your calls and your your trades. Yeah, yeah, for okay. plays and uh, you know, book notes, packets, all that stuff. I usually yeah. just like you know do book reviews because people don't have you know right. the time the, to the, read an eight hundred page. No, they're just lazy. Book. Yeah, they're lazy. It right. can't be yeah, pretty you dry. You could be nice and say they don't have time. Uh, they have time. They're just lazy. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, I, I hope you have a great fall trading season or, you know, your optionalities uh, uh, blow up in your favor, Adem. And I really appreciate you coming here and sharing your, uh, you're, one, you're one of the uh, smartest guys I know for such a young age. I'm, you know, always look forward to talking to you. Yeah, I definitely appreciate it, Dale. Thanks for having me on. All right. So my trading warrior brother, Adem, Tumerkin, and uh, you could find them. Uh, show the website one more time, Adem, so that when people look at the uh, video, they could see it and know how to find it. And uh, do you have any kind of uh, newsletter that you put out on this too? Uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I just do articles and stuff. And I also have a, a reading list on my site for anyone who's interested. Okay. It's for it's all the unlazy a... people that might actually all these sit down. Books. And... I yeah. was reading a book of. Um, friday you know why why my internet went down and came oh wow down. yeah so i was yeah, forced I, to read and anyway. i try to read <laughs> i try to read a couple hours every night but i'm a slow yeah. reader because i try to i write notes it helps me remember better but it yeah makes things very slow all right well uh, you know i appreciate you starting off our week adem and uh uh you know i'm going to be keeping an eye i'm going to start charting uranium and uh see if i see anything there uh as well so i appreciate you sharing your work with us today great thanks dale all right that's a wrap everyone remember don't just count your optionality count your blessings we'll see everyone for turnaround tuesday adios and uh follow adam at radical adam and on twitter and you have his website address check him out adios